Let the countdown continue. We are 63 days away from the start of college basketball season. We might be at the end of the summer, but yes, basketball is only two months away. Today, the preseason talk continues with our top fives. Yes, we're still doing top fives. This week, it's top five under the radar teams in the SEC. These are teams that maybe are getting a little disrespected, maybe have higher ceilings than maybe you're being led on to. Plus, Maddie and I put together our SEC fantasy basketball draft and our own way. It's an unofficial list of the best players in the SEC using our own rules and parameters and everything else. Um, in no way am I claiming to be a good fantasy drafter. You can ask my friends in my fantasy football league, but we're going to try our best. Join us talking about all that today and more on the Hoop Southbound Show. We've done the top five front courts. We've done the top five back courts, and there were eleven of the sixteen teams in the conference that either made a list or were in the honorable mentions. This week, we're doing something a little different. Uh, we're looking who's flying under the radar, who might be good or surprising based on the preseason talk we're seeing so far. No honorable mentions this week, just straight up top five from both of us. And discovering when we put our list together, Maddie and I found out that we have the exact same teams uh, in our top five. So what we're going to do today, instead of just going five and up, we're going to reveal one of our teams. We'll start from the bottom and then Maddie will tell you where she's got that team in the list and we'll go through our thinking a little bit. Uh, I base mine majority on confidence is how I built it um, and how much I trust the team possibly to break through that under the radar thing that's going on or being overlooked. Uh, Maddie, what was kind of your thinking? So my thinking, like you mentioned, 11 of the 16 teams made one of our previous lists. So I tried to look at the teams that may not have been mentioned or may have just been an honorable mention area there um, and then go through kind of what their class may be looking like coming in, who the coach is, and what kind of changes shifted from last year to this year, and where I think these teams may land, not necessarily in the top ranking of the SEC, but maybe better than most people are expecting to see them. I would say that part of that, yeah, for sure, is I'm on board with some of these teams, and I've mentioned some of these teams, but I still think that they're kind of under the radar, you know, like there's teams that are kind of getting talked about, but not getting talked about enough was also kind of my thinking on this as well. But like, without any further delay, let's just get started here because we actually have the same number five. If I remember looking right on our list there uh, and mine for number five team is Vanderbilt. Maddie, where do you have Vanderbilt? Number five as well. Okay, there we go. So I was right. Uh, looking at the list there, we do have them the same. This is the rundown. New head coach and Mark Byington from James Madison. This team is either uh, going to be consistently picked last or next to last in all the lists that we've seen so far. And that's because they lost a lot of talent in production with the coaching change. However, Vanderbilt has done some interesting things in the portal this offseason. Maddie, what were some of your thoughts on Vanderbilt? Yeah, I mean, the big three for me when you're looking at Vanderbilt, you've got a new coach, a new lineup and the new outlook from the fan base. So you've got more excitement pouring into this team than you have had in the previous years. Yeah, and I would also say that there's a new style of play, too, that's coming in. It's going to be a little bit different than the Jerry Stackhouse era. This is going to be much more of a transition-based team. They brought in some significant transfers in A.J. Hoggard out of Michigan State, Jason Edwards out of North Texas, and also some players in McLaughlin and Mannion. There's also a lot of experienced players on this team. Vanderbilt brought in nine upperclassmen from the transfer portal. Seven of their transfers also shot 30% or better from three. So they got the ability to shoot a little bit as well. They have more NCAA tournament minutes played on this team than South Carolina, Ole Miss, Oklahoma, Mississippi State, LSU, and Georgia. That's almost in the middle of the pack and experience in the NCAA tournament and big profile games. I'm not making a case that Vanderbilt's going to be SEC champions, but they could certainly be better than where the talk is at. Byington is a good coach and has been a winner, and he's upset some big teams. If you're just plugging Vandy at the bottom or in the bottom two, maybe reconsider that position just a little bit, because I think there's a little bit more to this team than just new coach, new roster. 
Yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the things that I mentioned in my big three was new coach, new lineup. Like you said, totally different style of play. It's going to get everybody excited. And then you look at that lineup a little bit deeper than, oh, they're adding players because they didn't have any good ones last year. You got to look at the production there. A lot of productivity from previous teams, like you said, a lot of experience in a Power 5 conference. Um, so I feel like a lot of that is going to translate to the SEC and hopefully put Vandy in a better position than a lot of people are thinking they're going to be in. I don't think, like, they could finish last. They could also finish top 10 somehow, like at 10 or 9. It, it, I don't think that that's out of the realm of possibility for Vanderbilt. So I, I do have more optimism on Vandy than maybe some people were thinking about. So for my number four team, I have Mississippi State. Maddie, where do you have Mississippi State at? So I have Mississippi State as my number two team. Okay, so we're both big on state. Why isn't state getting more love? I, <laughs> I, I think the reason is they lost Tolu Smith this offseason. But Maddie, maybe in your thoughts, because they're returning Josh Hubbard, they've been very successful, and we've seen a linear progression in them getting better under Chris Jans every year. Yeah, so that, that was my big thing is obviously they lost their biggest piece in Tolu Smith. But like you said, Josh Hubbard, you've also got Cam Matthews who are both returning. They were some larger pieces from last season. So I think, you know, they've got a lot to build on. They've already got some momentum um, coming off of last year in a better spot. And they've also had some great transfers come in. You've got Riley Kugel, who's got SEC experience. RJ Melendez, who has SEC experience and proven track records. They also have a couple of other transfers coming in that played at the higher level. You got Guy Chole, Kanye Clary, and Michael Nawako that played at Miami. So I think you're adding a lot of experience to this lineup who are used to playing, uh, you know, better levels of talent than some people may have coming in. I think Guy Chole popped in your head, but because he's a returner for this team, I think that just popped in your head somewhere on your notes. But <laughs> I'm with you. I've got Guy Chole written down in my notes, a matter of fact, too, because out of the returners, like you got Keyshawn Murphy and Guy Chole. With Tolu Smith out, this creates an opportunity for some of these big men to step up. And you mentioned those tra transfers, too. They got one coming in from Rhode Island, one coming in from Miami. Uh, I just did a video on their portal. There's going to be an opportunity for these front court players to take a bigger role and step up and be bigger on this Mississippi State team. And then Josh Hubbard was a monster last year. You loved watching Josh Hubbard play basketball. As as somebody who was a little bit more neutral on Mississippi State, I was sitting there like, this kid is exciting, he's fun, and he could be a big-time player in this conference. He certainly was undervalued as a freshman. So I've got some hope for Mississippi State. Um, I don't know if this is going to be just a year where they keep going up in necessarily the standings in the SEC, but I don't necessarily think they're going to take a step back. And I think that's kind of almost where some of the talk is, is that I've seen them consistently pick toward the bottom portion of the conference. Yeah, I think they've got some great pieces. We've seen Chris Jans do some amazing things with rosters that people may not think are amazing. So it'll be interesting to see how he gets this new crop of guys, mix them in with, you know, the people that are coming back and kind of see where he takes state. Yeah, it's going to be a tough road for Mississippi State because the conference got deeper and better again this year. But he's been successful, so let's see what Chris Jans can do. That's why I've got them, my number four team, under the radar. So my number three, Maddie, I've got Ole Miss. And where do you have Ole Miss at? I have Ole Miss at three as well. Okay, so we're in agreement on Ole Miss. So fun fact, Chris Beard has never gone more than a season without making the NCAA tournament at any level, whether we're talking about McMurray, Angelo State, whatever. Man makes the tournament and gets them there as fast as possible. Also, last season was Beard's worst finish in conference play ever. Prior to last year, Beard has never finished worse than seventh in the conference standings. Year two has always been a second place finish with the exception of the 2020-21 season where he finished third. Um, so it's been consistent and he ends up somewhere in the top. Uh, how, this, how that goes in year two. Not saying they're going to finish top three, but don't be surprised if they crack that upper class of the SEC like sixth or better somehow uh, through the season. Maddie, thoughts on Ole Miss? So you go down the roster, which we've got a lot of roster talk here, but they are returning some of their best players. You've got Brakefield and Morrell both coming back, which is huge for Chris Beard. While I personally was very critical about their front court last season, they've added some decent transfers and got some incoming freshmen that are going to add both depth and height to this roster. 
For sure. And then let's talk about the three point shooting that they added. There's that, like I said, 10 upperclassmen uh, that came through to this team and they have the ability to shoot with three out of the eight players who shot 35% or better from three. They only lost 35% of their scoring production from last season. That's the second best retention in the SEC. I would expect this team to put up points. Only thing I'm not really sure about with Ole Miss is the five spot. Bowl is talented, but inexperienced, and they don't really have a conventional big time big behind him or in front of him to help him grow. So it's a curious spot there at the five position. But pay attention to Ole Miss. Don't just pass them up because of conventional top teams of the SEC or Ole Miss's history. Ole Miss has a chance to make the tournament for the 10th time in school history, and they could do it with a decent seed this year is kind of where I'm thinking with Ole Miss right now. All right, Maddie, my number two team, I've got the Georgia Bulldogs. Maddie, where do you have Georgia at? I've got Georgia as my number one for under the radar. Okay, so we're both big on Georgia, and I feel like I owe everybody an explanation. So back on the Decision Day reaction episode, I had Georgia picked last, but our thing has been react on Decision Day, do some more homework, come back to it when we do preseason talk. See, my thinking has actually changed a little bit on Georgia. I'm not out here thinking they're going to win the SEC or anything, but I looked at Georgia a little harder to see exactly what they're trying to do. And this is a team built on potential and opening a window to break into the NCAA tournament for the first time in 10 years. They're on a 10-year drought at that school right now to make the NCAA tournament. Maddie, I'm going to go through plenty of players here, but this was the key thing that started changing my mind on Georgia and why I'm a little bit more optimistic than I was. They have stars and they got talent. Blue Kane, Silas DeMurray Jr., Dylan James, all four-star prospects from last season returning to Georgia. Five-star Asa Newell and four-star and four-star Samto Cyrell are adding to that front court as well. So you've got four stars and five stars throughout this lineup. Um, you've also got Dresdick, um, who is a four-star on some sites as well. Point is, they got talent, and I think that's something you need to consider because talent can help you win some basketball games, and I think it's cracking open a window now for Georgia with so much high talent coming in. And fun fact on Asa Newell, he is the highest prospect that Georgia has ever gotten behind only Anthony Edwards. So it's there's some, there's some history being made right now in the Mike White um, era right now in Georgia. Matty, your thoughts on Georgia? Yeah, so like you mentioned, they have a ton of talent returning. Most of that talent's pretty young, but we saw them grow throughout the season last year. So you've got to think you get some solid transfers in there to help this young core kind of grow. They're going to play a little bit more mature than we saw them last season, and that's going to help assist in their decision-making. And then you take a look at Mike White. He's consistently grown throughout his time at Georgia, so I think we see another step in the right direction here. I can see that as well. Uh, and then you got experienced guys like Tyron Lawrence, who's played in the SEC and has been successful. And then also Dakota Lafue. Uh, so those are two guys who are going to help Georgia on the experience front and kind of guide these young talents the best they can. Then also just thinking about where Georgia ended up last year. They won 20 games last year. Think, think about that for a moment. This team won 20 games last year. And then on top of that, while they didn't make the NCAA tournament, they made a run in the NIT last season to the semifinals. It's been progression, like you were saying, under Mike White. Can they break through this season? It's been baby steps, but can they do it this year? And I feel like that window is just slowly opening for them, and we're kind of seeing the direction Mike White's taking this team is to put talent and grow the experience there homegrown and hopefully keep some roster continuity for the future. And hopefully there's an opportunity for Georgia to come out and uh, make the uh, in this drought in this drought for the Bulldogs, so to speak. All right, yeah, I so... Can see them sitting, oh, I can definitely see them sitting middle of the pack, SEC, you know, if things work out the way we think they're going to. It's possible. It's certainly possible. Um, I've definitely changed my mind on that last place thinking now for Georgia just kind of seeing the direction they're taking things. All right, so my number one team, I've got Missouri. Maddie, I don't think you have it because I think you've already named a number one. So where do you have Missouri at? I've got Missouri at number four. Okay, so this is actually interesting because back on Decision Day, 
We both had two very different opinions on Missouri. I was more optimistic on Missouri. You were a little bit more pessimistic and had them outside the top 10. I had them in my top, I think, seven or somewhere in that neighborhood. I had some optimism about what Missouri is going to do. And we both know the reason why. It has to do with the combination of that 0-18 last season in SEC play and then the question being surrounding how successful and impactful is Dennis Gates or was it Kobe Brown and Hodge a little bit uh, more back there two years ago. But like looking at this team, they're being pretty much consistently picked like 10th in the SEC, which isn't really bad for how deep this league is, but they might crack in a little higher than that. Especially when you look at the fact that they have the number five recruiting class in the country and the number 13 transfer class. Maddie, kind of your thoughts a little bit more on Missouri. So you look at Missouri, they have an absolutely stellar recruiting class. They've got best best recruit out of Arkansas coming to Missouri. Um, and then, like you said, they've got a great transfer class. But despite their standing last season, they did have some good basketball players. And some of those players are returning. You've got to think they're coming in with a chip on their shoulder and hopefully a little bit of a drive to achieve more than they did last season. Yeah, for sure. You said Tamar Bates, uh, he's back for Missouri. And Caleb Thank Brill you. is coming back from injury for Missouri. And certainly two guys who can help you win some games in SEC play this year. Transfer portal, I feel like the big highlights are Mark Mitchell out of Duke. And then Tony Perkins out of Iowa and the 19 points a game, Mr. Jacob Cruz coming from UT Martin as well. So picture this, if Missouri won even five games last year, does it kind of change your perspective on this team coming into this season? Um, that's why I have them as my number one team under the radar, because I definitely feel like if things had gone just a little better, I don't think we'd be having the same conversation right now. And I think there's a lot of bad taste out there. Maddie, kind of your thoughts on that portion. If Missouri had won a game or two or in SEC play, we didn't have high expectations really for them last year. So would that change your thinking at all on the, on this Missouri team? Uh, I mean, possibly. I think the main thing for me is how they transition and use this recruiting class to, you know, raise the level a little bit. That's the biggest thing for me is because, you know, like I said, we've got some players returning um, that were impactful, but how is that going to change? And I think we look at Dennis Gates, there's absolutely no way he lets the crap show that happened last season repeat. So, you know, he's going to be fighting for his job because if he goes 0-18 again, I don't think he sticks around much longer. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then – so, like I said, I think we, we have to see how he's going to use these recruits and how these players that are returning, how how they perform. Because you, you've got to be a little bit different from last year. So, you know, I think, you know, if, if they ended up in a better spot last season, I think you may be a little bit different. But I'm still going in with a lot of caution on this Missouri team. I, I definitely understand where you're coming from because I've seen the whole entire thing from everybody else out there in the country on Missouri. I understand the thinking. I'm just saying there's a lot of talent on this team, and I tend to be a little bit more optimistic on Dennis Gates than others. I'm feeling Missouri might do a lot better and fly under that radar. Now, if he goes 0-18 again, yeah, there's going to be problems, and there's a lot more expectation riding on this season, so I think there's a lot more pressure on Dennis Gates this year to do well, not necessarily just blow everyone's socks off, but do well in the SEC this season. And I think he's got the roster to do it. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's any way he goes 0-18 again. No, I mean, I don't you got, think that's you've got too much talent. You've got, like I said, you've got these players that are returning that surely have some sort of chip on their shoulder with everything that was said about this team last season. Um, you got to do something here. So, right. you know. I'm optimistic that they aren't going to be terrible, but I also don't think they're going to come out and win the SEC. The bar is pretty simple. Do well mm -hmm. in the SEC, make the NCAA tournament. If you accomplish those two things, I think Missouri fans are going to be fine with it. All right. So as I said in the intro, um, I'm not the best at fantasy sports drafting, so you could look at my fantasy football record. So when we maybe make a bad team, it's probably on me. So just general thoughts there. And then Maddie really doesn't play fantasy sports. She told me backstage. So 
we're going to see how this goes. We're going to have some fun with it today. So in general, here we go. We did a coin toss uh, to get us started. We're going to do this snake draft style. So I actually won the coin toss to get us started backstage here. So we did had Siri do it. Matt, it was on Maddie's phone and she told me it was, told me it was Tails. So here we go. I'm going to lead us off here with our fantasy pick. And I'm going to start off with, I would pick a guard because there's a lot of talent out there. But I think the center spot's the more difficult one. So I'm going to go with the running back situation. Kind of, you don't draft the quarterback first in NFL football. So I'm going to draft Janai Broom uh, as my center on my team. Maddie, where are you going to? And when it comes to Janai game Broom, plan, David. do what? That was my game plan. And I am so mad at you right now. <laughs> well, I'll talk about Janai Broom real fast while you're thinking <laughs> about your pick here. You know, Janai Broom, we talked about him last week in the top five front courts. 6'10, 240 pounds, put up 16.5 points per game, almost nine rebounds a night. This guy can get double doubles, no problem. He's returning to Auburn as a graduate. He's in his final year of eligibility. He has been one of the best big men consistently in the SEC for the last couple of years. Very excited what Janai Broom can bring this season. I think he would do quite well on my fantasy team. Maddie, who are you going with with your pick? Well, since you stole what I had in my head as my first pick, I am going to go Mark Sears and take probably the best of the guards that are available, um, which is all of them right now. So obviously he's on kind of the short list for national player of the year after coming back to Alabama led them to that final four last season so I think we can expect some big things from Mark Sears coming into this year yeah I, I like the pick Mark Sears is definitely one of those players that I was thinking about I was like I'm either going to take Mark Sears or deny broom first I'm going to see if I win this thing or not so Mark Sears being the number one guard taken off the board is definitely the right pick I feel like and he was an awesome contributor last year for Alabama. So I'm going to look a little bit more here and I feel like I'm good, good on the forwards. I feel like there's a lot of forwards out there that I can take. So I'm also going to go with a guard here since you took Sears and I'm kind of torn. Yeah, between... I, thought I went next. I thought we were doing oh, this it thing. is your turn. It is your turn. My bad. I'm already trying to steal my people. I'm trying to steal players them. from you. Go ahead. <laughs> You're okay. no where I'm looking at. So give me Jonas Adu. I'm going to take the next pick best center i i like that move as well jonas adu in arkansas one of the best transfers in the portal this offseason evan me has got him projected pretty darn good coming in the next year and had an excellent season at tennessee last year so i think um in in the short list of centers that we have that are our true centers i think jonas adu is probably my best bet for a, for a solid position there I like it a lot. All right. So I need a guard. I feel like I was just thinking about the forwards, but I think there's plenty of good forwards on the board right now. So I'm going to go with the move here. Can I do, I go potential or do I go someone that I'm a little bit more trusted in? And I'm actually going to go Wade Taylor as my, uh, as one of my guards at a Texas A&M. Look, we know who Wade Taylor is. If you've been following this conference for a minute, absolute stud last season, he, for Texas A&M, Wade Taylor ended up putting up, what was it, 19.1 points per game, and he shot just just around 36% from the field. He had a lot of pressure on him, but he also, when he gets to the free throw line, also puts up points uh, at 84%. And then rebounds, Texas A&M, we know rebounds well as a collective, so I'm going to pick up some points for rebounds as well. He was also four assists a game, too. So that, that to me, is a good chunk of fantasy points uh, there for Wade Taylor. So I'm going to go Wade Taylor as my first guard off the board. Maddie? Nope, it's your turn. You oh, go it for is. it. I, I keep doing that because that's how we did the top five list this year. Yeah, All right, you're good. So I've got that move taken care of. Now I'm going to go somebody a little bit more on the potential side here, and I'm going to take another guard, and I'm going to go Janelle Davis is what I'm going to do from Arkansas. Um, Davis obviously came in, if you've seen the rankings from 24-7 Sports and on three, one of the best transfers in the country. And look, this guy hit 50% from corner threes last season over at Florida Atlantic. He's very experienced. He's going to play a player that's going to, I expect, put up a decent amount of points for Arkansas. He had 18.2 points per game, six rebounds a game. And just under three rebounds a game uh, for Florida Atlantic last season. And he was 41.4% from three. Um, Wade Taylor may be a consistent scorer. And I just trust the fact I know he's going to do well in this conference. Janelle Davis is a good, like, 
it seems consistent. I feel confident in it. As long as he clicks on his new team, seems like a great pick. And that's the potential boomer bust there uh, for Janelle Davis. But he's one I got high confidence in out of the transfer portal. So I'm going to Janelle Davis out of Arkansas as my second guard. Maddie, where are you yeah, going that's at? A that's a good one. Um, I'm going to go over to the forward spot and continue on my transfer train with a doofy arrow. We've okay. talked about him a little bit. He was a bit of a Swiss army knife, could probably be considered in the forward spot or the guard spot. So I think he's a good player to be able to go out there and kind of, you know, get it done anywhere on the court. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, I've got doofy arrow as one of my possible drafts as well especially if he steps his game up this year, uh, just a little bit more, especially from the three-point shooting perspective. If he can do that, he's a heck of a basketball player. All right, what are you thinking for your next pick, Maddie? So I'm going to take, run it back, um, go to the guard spot and take Zakai Ziegler out of Tennessee. A okay. big, big double Z fan, um, you know, had a rough injury, but he was able to come back strong from that, I feel like, at the end of last season. Um, and I think there's going to be some room kind of opening up for him to show off a little bit more of his skills now that he's going to have to be a little bit more of a leader, seeing as a lot of that production from that Tennessee team left. And you know what I like about this pick, though, from a fantasy perspective, because you get points for assists over six assists a night for his average last season at 6.1. And then he's also a good defender at 1.7 steals per game. So it's not just the points here we're looking at with 11.8 per game. Getting some other contributions as well in there. I like that pick a lot. All right, so it's back to me here. I'm going to take a forward uh, just to make sure I'm rounded out my roster here. I feel like there's, it's getting to a point where we're going to start looking at a little bit more forwards, and I'm going to take Andrew Carr out of Kentucky. A good shooter. Um, he could shoot well from the three-point line. He's been consistently good uh, at his last stop. I believe it was Wake Forest. Wake Forest, yes, it was. Uh, last season for Andrew Carr, um, 13.5 points per game, almost seven rebounds a night. And like I mentioned, 37.1% from three. He's somebody that could put up points in a hurry. I like the take here. Um, and also he can block the basketball as well, almost gets about two blocks a game. So some of those other aspect points as well. So I'm going to go Andrew Carr here out of Kentucky. Okay, I like it. That's a good pick. I think he is going to be a big contributor to Kentucky this season. Absolutely. All right. And then my next pick, um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take another guard is what I'm planning here. And on those guards, I'm going to end up taking my first bench player here and I'm going to go Trey Johnson out of Texas. This to me is one of those more risky picks and I probably shouldn't take it here. Um, but we're talking about the number one freshman coming into the SEC this season, according to 24-7 sports, and also one that shoots. He can shoot well and put up a lot of points in a hurry. He's not someone that I don't think is necessarily going to get me a bunch of points uh, off the assists and everything else in his first season of college basketball. What's probably going to be his only season of college basketball. But if I get an injury on my team, Trey Johnson might be someone who can put up a lot of points in a hurry on a good night or against a bad defensive team. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and take Trey Johnson as one of my riskier picks uh, in my fantasy draft here. Maddie. Okay, let's go Henry Coleman. I Henry think Coleman. he is a good forward that's going to come out of Texas A&M. You know, we've mentioned they've got a pretty sizable front court, and I think he was a big contributor last season that's going to continue to help your pick and Wade Taylor. Um, kind of get things going over there for the Aggies. I like it. I like Henry Taylor or Henry Coleman a lot. Um, consistent rebounder, put up points, and it could be a bigger year for him as he continues to move forward. So I, I do like that pick quite a bit out of your forward spot. Where's the Where are you going next? Because you got a starting five now, so you got your flex and yep. your bench. So let's move to the bench, and I am going to take Tremon Mark out of the Longhorns. Okay. Um, you know, had a great year Arkansas last season kind of one of those players that you could consider you know in the guard spot could play a little bit of forward if he needed to had a great mid-range game I don't care what you say David <laughs> but I think he's going to be very helpful to Texas this season look he's going to get points one way or the other uh he was one of the best scorers in the SEC last season he's surrounded by more talent this year I can understand the pick on Tremont Mark uh being on this list here all right, so it comes back to me now, and where am I going to go? I still got a forward and a flex spot to fill and two bench spots here. So 
what am I thinking here? I'm going to hit the flex real fast, and I'm going to go find someone else I think it might put up quite a few points this season. This might be a gamble, but this is going to be my second gamble. And I'm going to go Chaz Lanier out of Tennessee. Look, there's a lot of hype going into Chaz Lanier right now when it comes to what he might be able to produce for Tennessee this season. 19.7 points per game, almost five rebounds a night. Uh, doesn't pass a lot, uh, but gets two assists to throw on top of there and almost one steal a game. If he translates out of the, he translates his game from North Florida to the SEC, we're going to see something special. I'm pretty sure if everything works out for him, uh, moving on and got to admit what Rick Barnes did with Dalton connect last season, probably puts things in a pretty bright light, uh, for what Chaz Lanier might bring to this Tennessee team for next season. So why you went Zakai Ziegler. I'm going to put Chaz Lanier in my flex spot. And you know what? I, I want to spread out my teams here a little bit. So I'm not going to take who I thought I wanted to to finish out my roster. So I'm going to go somewhere a little bit different out of the forwards here. And I'm going to go to Ole Miss and take Breakfield. Uh, so last season, Breakfield was one of the better players on this Ole Miss roster. He had 12.9 points per game, five rebounds a night, just about two and almost two and a half assists and he played decent defense and he shot 47.7% from the floor and 36.2% from three. He's a graduate this season. He's experienced. I, I'm a little worried about the congestion on the overall roster, but he was one of the better ones at Ole Miss. So I'm pretty confident he'll be back. So I'm going to take Breakfield out of Ole Miss uh, for my last pick here. And that'll feel out my, starting my starting rotation so i got two bench players left maddie you've got a flex and two bench left to fill here so where are you going i'm gonna throw a little bit of a wild card out here okay i'm gonna take my flex player and felix akpara felix okay i like it he came from um ohio state average around 6.6 .6 points a game 6.4 rebounds and half an assist but the big thing here for me is his field goal percentage is 58.6. He should be a focal point, right? Like for Tennessee, because they lost all their centers <laughs> besides JP Estrella. Uh, so like he should be a focal point for this team next season and could be a breakout year for uh, Akpara now. Uh, yeah, that he's because there. he's listed as um, kind of one of those players that could play forward, could play center. So I think we're going to see a lot of production from him and from the volunteers this season. I think he also serves as a great backup center for you. Um, mm -hmm. If you know, in an a do situation on your roster there. All right. Definitely. So your next pick is my next bench player. I'm going to go DJ Wagner. You're going to go DJ Wagner. Also banking on the breakout for DJ Wagner next season. <laughs> Definitely. You know, um, coming into Arkansas, there's a lot of potential on this team, a lot of talent, um, but we did see DJ Wagner have some shining moments last year for Kentucky. And I think, you know, with a little less congestion and, you know, Kentucky being Kentucky, I think he's going to have some room to breathe and really break out this season. Well, I, I will say this. I think there's optimism on his three-point shooting coming into this season. He did average almost 10 points a game. And that was his first year of college basketball. And a lot of sites like him. So there's there's a lot of thought that DJ Wagner could be a breakout player this season. So that's not a crazy pick to me at all. Um, so I, I don't hate it. I think you're getting a little guard heavy in your picks, but uh, I don't hate it at all. So <laughs> I feel like some of my guards, though, are those kind of transitional pieces that could play guard or forward. So I think, you know, I have a feeling the production's going to weigh out in my head. <laughs> ah, fair enough. All right. So my next player here i've got two bench spots left to fill and then maddie you'll have the last pick in this thing uh and getting uh, the last player so i need a backup center for my team and i'm going to go to one of the guys that actually i didn't think he'd still be on the board um so i just realized that there's a player that might have a little bit more confidence in on the board so i'm torn between two players and i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to put some faith in alabama and i'm going to go clifford amori for my uh back up look he played great uh for Rutgers last season he's a dominant player and he brings a lot on the defensive end for the tide and something that they drastically needed last year 10.4 points per game pulled down almost eight rebounds a night and then on top of that was 51 percent from the field almost three blocks a game 
So that's that's some good points there. So I'm gonna go take I'm gonna take the kid out of Ruck, transferring from Rutgers and Cliff O'Mori, and I'm gonna put that down, experienced player, and that's gonna be my backup center. I had another one in mind, but I just realized Amori was still on the board here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take him. And then my final pick, I'm probably in need of a backup forward. So when I look at the forwards here, it's kind of getting a little bit congested. Um, but I'm going to go and I'm going to take another risk here. And I'm going to go on five-star incoming freshman Asa Newell out of Georgia is what I'm going to do. Big expectations on this kid, like I said the best recruit that Georgia has gotten since Anthony Edwards. So that's going to round out my team. Um, there's some players that I think are still out there that I would love to pick up in free agency. Um, but Maddie, I'm interested to see who your uh, last pick is here. So, you know, you talked about how we're getting a little guard heavy on mine. I am going to take a backup center because, you know, those big men sometimes prone to injury. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a bit of a wild card, though. And I don't think anybody's going to be expecting this. I'm 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 curious if you're going to take the guy that I was thinking I was going to end up taking this entire time as my backup center. Let's go freshman John Bull. You're going to have John Bull. Okay. I mean, dude's a, a tree, literally. He is a ginormous, and he's not even really a man yet. I think he's, is he 18? I, I think so. he's coming from overtime elite. I know that. <laughs> I haven't seen um, him yet. <laughs> Let's see. Last, uh, I saw something that said he was now seven two, but it's showing seven foot one. But you know, I had had some judgments about tall players on Ole Miss last year, so I'm trying to make up for it a little bit. But hopefully, this guy gets in there and he is being as productive as he was at overtime elite. Averaged ten point six points per game, nine point nine rebounds, and one point eight blocks. I mean, we're talking about a player who's been kind of consistently just outside the top 50 players in the country uh, come as incoming freshmen. And he should be a focal point for Ole Miss because they really don't have a true backup big man. And he should see some minutes. Um, so if he has a breakout, I could see that as a good bench player possibly um, mm -hmm. for your for your roster here. Um, very surprised you didn't take who I was going to take because I mentioned him a lot last week during our top five. Santos. Do what? Santos Cyril. No, it wasn't something too serial. I was going to go Alex Condon. Okay. I see. I had him listed as a forward. So, oh, okay. I had him one of those like back and forth, could be either one. A bit of a flex player. I can understand that. Um, yeah, I, I, I could see that. So, like, yeah, it's 6'11, 230 pounds. I, I think Alex Condon was a player that probably should have made our draft and we had a three team draft. He probably, I probably would have ended up taking him as my backup, is how that would have worked out because. I, I want to take this risk on Alex Condon that he may be one of the big breakouts uh, for his sophomore campaign in the SEC coming to this season. He's a talented player, and he's got a clear front court to play in right now because he split a lot of minutes between Han Logden and uh, Tyree Samuel last year. So he should be a player to keep an eye on for sure. Um, Matty, I, I mentioned Alex Condon, another player that you maybe think that we left out of here on our draft that probably should get some talk. Um, another one that I think... You know, I I contemplated back and forth on. I actually have two, um, both forwards that my pick for Henry Coleman. I was I was trying to trying to figure out which one I was going with. We've got Jordan Butler. Okay, um, so you're expecting a breakout for Jordan Butler in South Carolina. I, I think he is going to be much more productive in South Carolina because I don't think we saw what we needed to see from him out of Missouri. We kind of talked about their situation and how. You know, under different circumstances, I think he he would have been, you know, a bright spot for that team or Big Z who transferred from Kentucky to Arkansas, who I think is going to have a breakout year as well. Yeah, I, I have Big Z on my list as well. Um, it, a lot of talk right now about Big Z. If you go listen to other podcasts, particularly Locked In right now, they're talking about Big Z a lot over on Locked On College Basketball and as a breakout player. And Evan Mia likes him. There's a lot of teams. There's a lot of places out there that like him. Um, so I'll just go through like my complete list because I think you basically just did the same thing um, on players I was looking to draft. Um, so. Boogie Fland I had on my list, Josh Hubbard I had on my list, uh, Jacob Cruz out of Missouri, one of the transfers. I think one of the few Oklahoma players I put on here, Duke Miles. Uh, I also had Matthew Morrell on here, Jordan Pope out of Texas, and uh, just, or Jason Edwards out of Vanderbilt. Out of my forwards that we didn't draft, um, but probably should get some talk, you know, 
Grant Nelson, uh, freshman Carter Knox, uh, Ruben Chinyelu out of Florida is possible uh, good player that might be emerging out there. He was one of those that I wrote down as possible, you know, take a risk on. RJ Godfrey, uh, another player I was taking a look at as a possible risk on. Not great numbers out of Clemson, but he was looking looked at like he was going to be the next guy in Clemson. And I think he's going to take a big role in Georgia as well. Mark Mitchell out of Missouri is another player. Cam Matthews out of Mississippi State. Mikel Brown-Jones out of Ole Miss. Uh, Colin Murray Boyles out of South Carolina. Uh, Igor Milicic, uh, I just didn't want to draft from the same team. I kept passing on Igor because um, it was like, you know, rule of fantasy. You don't draft from the same team over and over again in case someone gets hurt by week, whatever. Uh, so I was passing on uh, Igor Milicic, but he's probably someone who should have got some talk. Arthur Kaluma out of Texas, uh, another one of the forwards there that we didn't mention. And then out of the centers, uh, I also had Santos Irel, um, Peyton Marshall, and then Farrell Payne and J.P. Estrella as also a player who might have a breakout this year. Um, someone's going to be a focal point in that SEC or in that Tennessee front court. So I wrote J.P. Estrella down there as a possible one. You went the Felix Otparo route. One of those guys should be the dude. One of those guys should be the dude there in Tennessee this coming season. So we'll see which one it's going to be and who can emerge as like the dominant big man for Tennessee coming into this next season. So uh, anybody else on your list, Maddie, that we didn't get to? Um, I mean, your list pretty much covered all of mine. Um, the only ones that were not mentioned, we got Trent Burns and then Amari Williams, both centers, um, who weren't covered in your list. Everybody else, um, mentioned Josh Hubbard, mentioned, um, JP Australia, mentioned, um, that one of the, it was one of the Texas players. <laughs> Yeah, we're trying to find it. You got Tremont Mark. It was Tremont yeah. Mark, I think, is who we were talking about there. Oh, no, Kaluma. Kaluma. Okay, so you did put Kaluma down. Okay, so, yeah, it's it's tough. Uh, I wish we had a third person playing with us, and maybe next season we'll get a guest and see if they want to play with us and uh, try to put together a third team. Um, because, like I said, there's plenty of players that I wrote down thinking, okay, this would be good, this would be good. Um trying to build that all SEC fantasy team here uh, between the two of us. But I, I'm i interested in it. Here's the list for everybody who's watching at home uh, right now. So it was fun. This was, a, this was a good little experiment, I feel like. I'm sure there's going to be hate in the comment section for us because uh, we didn't pick a good player. Again, I'm not saying I'm good at fantasy drafting, so, <laughs> and neither is Maddie. So uh, we're just trying to apply some kind of logic to it and just start the scoring system that we were looking at for uh, for NBA fantasy picks. And that's how we tried to apply it here. But guys, if you have not already, please like and subscribe to the Hoop Southbound show. We'd greatly appreciate it. We're on the way to the season. It's coming up. Uh, we've also got the Freshman 15 series still continuing. We're also finishing up the portal right now. We're over halfway done. Our Missouri video begins the second half of the uh, portal series. So we're just going down the list. Uh, that is a long series. And next year I'm doing it in a totally different way. It's a hard one uh, to put together. But Portal series coming out, freshman 15, more episodes on the way. We start season previews next week. Oh, yeah, we're talking two teams next week. We're going to have two episodes on the Hoop Southbound show. And we're doing the list not in alphabetical order this year. It is an alphabetical order. But let's see if you guys can guess it in the comment section on what the order that we're releasing the season previews are uh this season maddie kind of raised her eyebrows at me when i put it together and she was like what order is this and how did you figure this out so um yeah if you guys can figure it out how i did it it is i'm giving you a hint it is in some kind of alphabetical order all right so guys until next time we'll see you. we'll see you next time and we'll be talking hoops thanks guys have a great week